Hi everyone, it's Dr. Moby Motion, and today we're going to dive straight into this tutorial on how to make this water feature. Now you couldn't make your mind up about whether you wanted one long tutorial or separate short videos, each covering one important topic. So I've decided to do the best of both. I'm going to have timestamps here on screen and in the video description. And if you want, you can use those to skip around and only look at the sections of the video that you want to learn about. So without further ado, let's get started. And before we even start, we're going to save our scene so that we can save it more easily later on and we don't lose our progress. Now we're going to delete this light, but we're going to keep this cube and we're going to use it for the first part of this tutorial, which is the modeling and how we're going to build the physical structure of the water feature. Now, if you support me on Patreon, you can download this water feature model ready to use. So if you'd like, if you don't want to spend the time modeling it, you can download that and skip straight to the fluid simulation section. But let's get into the modeling. Now, it's super important to have reference images. And I'm going to be basing this water feature on this real life water feature that I saw in London. And I'll also have a link to this down in the description so you can download it and have it on your phone or in a separate window so you can use it as reference as well while you work. We're going to start off in this cube, go into edit mode with tab, and we'll look at it from side view by pressing 3. And we're going to scale it in the Z axis. 0.2. Now if we look at it from the top view, we're going to create this first layer up there, which is roughly square, um, but I want it to be a bit bigger than this, so let's scale it two times. That gives us a nice, ooh, that made it taller as well. To avoid that, we're going to scale and press Shift Z to lock the z-axis and that keeps its height but it makes it bigger in the other axes. Now we're going to give it the edges that are going to keep the water in but also the hole that the water is going to flow out of and we'll do this with a series of loop cuts. So we're going to hover over the cube, we're going to press Control R, we're going to scroll up with the mouse wheel so we get two loop cuts, we're going to click and now we right click to keep them in the default position in the middle now we're going to add loop cuts in the other axis. Again, press Control R, scroll up, uh, left click, and now right click, and it keeps it in the default position in the middle. Now we'll press 7 to go into top view, and we'll go into wireframe by pressing Z and 4. And we're going to select this loop cut that we made earlier on. We're going to grab it in the X axis until it's about there. And I like being super precise when I model, so I'm gonna snap this to the grid, like so. And now you can see the thickness. The thickness is four squares. And we're gonna keep that all around. Now this looks uneven, but we'll fix that later when we set the scale of the other loop cuts. So let's do this one at a time. We'll select this loop, We'll grab it in the x-axis until our border is about four thick. Now shift S, snap selection to grid. Now we'll select all of these, snap them to grid. You can see they're nice and straight again. So we'll select this, grab it in the y-axis. And I'm holding control, by the way, so it snaps into place. Again, we'll make this four, so it's a nice even border around. Let's select this. We'll grab it in the Y axis. Again, give it a border of four. Now we have a nice base that we're gonna build our water feature from. Because this is gonna be very useful later on, I'm gonna shift D to duplicate it on the Y axis so that we can use it later whenever we need. So I'll select this back, go back to top view, and I'm gonna make a second set of loop cuts in this axis. Again, keep them in the middle, that's fine. And these are gonna be used for the hole that's gonna let the water flow out of this section. 
again I'm going to snap this to grid the hole looks a bit too small so I'm going to scale it to the x-axis about there and again I'll snap it to grid and that looks great where it is now we'll get a solid view and we're going to hold shift and select all these faces around the border except for the hole where the water is going to flow out so we're going to select all of these and now we can extrude and I found extruding by 0.8 works really well and there you have the first section of our water feature now we're going to grab this up in the Z axis by 2 and in side view I'm going to duplicate it down and I'm going to leave a gap of three small squares between these two sections and this duplicate is going to be our second section of the water feature so to make it look more like that we're going to grab it in this direction we're going to rotate it in the Z axis by pressing R and Z and typing in 90 and it rotates it exactly 90 degrees and now we want to make it a bit bigger but if we make it bigger like this you can see the borders also get bigger so we're actually going to make it bigger in a slightly different way just another look at the reference okay. we're going to go to top view wireframe mode and edit mode and we'll go back to vertex edit mode and we'll select all of these vertices and we'll grab them in the y-axis hold control so they're nice and precise and we're going to move them 0.4 you can see exactly how much I moved it in the top right there so you can see when I do it to the other set on the other side I'll move it by the same amount and that will keep it nice and symmetrical so So that's what we have here. I'm also going to make this opening a bit bigger. And again, I'll do that in the wireframe mode. So I'll grab this in the Y axis, 0.1. And this, I'll grab in the Y axis, minus 0.1. And there you are, a slightly bigger opening. Now we're going to repeat this process for the next few blocks. We'll grab this up slightly to give us more room. We'll duplicate this in the Z axis. Leave a gap of three small squares. I found that works well. We're going to rotate it in the Z, this time by minus 90 degrees. And you can do that either by typing minus 90 or 90 and then the minus afterwards, either works. And we're gonna look at the reference. So this shape is nice and elongated. And there's an opening right over there. Top view with seven. The wireframe mode, which helps you really easily see through these objects. We're gonna grab this over there initially. And you can see I'm trying to line it up so that this opening goes directly into the middle of this container. So I'm going to go to the side view with three. And I'm going to grab this on the Y axis until it's right about there. You can see it lines up with the middle of the previous opening. Now we're going to make it bigger. Again, in wireframe mode, we're going to select all of these vertices grab them in the x-axis until they sit about there and let's look at this in solid view that looks about right now there's only one section left which is this final bottom section which is very similar to this section before it 
So again, I'll duplicate this in the z-axis, leave a gap of three, and we'll grab this so it sits in front. Now the difference between these two is that the opening here is in the middle, it's not off to the side. So let's do that now. Top view, edit mode, wireframe, and we'll select this opening here, and we're gonna move it right into the middle of our fountain piece, back into solid view. And then you have the base of our water feature. Just move this back slightly to about there. Now I'm gonna add this base, which you don't actually see in the main water feature, but it allows our final water to flow down, flow around the feature like this. And I think that looks really nice. And to do this, we're gonna use this original piece. So we'll duplicate it. It's already in move mode, so if we press Shift and Z, it'll move it, but it'll lock the Z axis. I'll move it to roughly here. I'm gonna select all the other pieces and move them off. I'll grab this in the Z so it sits on top of the floor. And again, I'm gonna make it bigger in edit mode in wireframe so we can see exactly what we're doing. We're gonna grab these on this axis until it's bigger than the water feature, but only just bigger, so right about there. We want the inner border of this outer wall to contain our water feature, so I want it to sit like this. And we'll do the same with the other side. Grab this on the x-axis, hold control, grab this in the Y axis, hold control, and we'll make it sit just outside our water feature. And now this one, we can't grab it just to here like we did before, because then this water that's flowing out of the last section will bounce off the wall and that'll look weird. So we're gonna give it some extra space in this side. Let's say, about there. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing we did before. We'll go into face select mode. We'll select these edge faces. This time we're selecting all of them because we don't need any opening. And we're going to extrude again 0.8. And now we have the most important sections of the water feature, but at the moment they're all floating. So we need to add these pillars that the different sections are gonna sit on top of. This is really easy to do. We're gonna do this just with some cubes that we're gonna scale. And we're gonna start from the top again. So we're going to side view by pressing three. We'll press shift A to add a cube, and we're gonna move this over here. We're gonna move this exactly underneath the first section. And again, we're gonna model in edit mode. We're gonna move these back so they don't intersect with the other section. This is easier in vertex select. And we'll grab this down until it just sits on top of our container. Now in top view, we can see that's already nice and centered actually, so we can keep that as it is. Let's just have a look at it in solid view, and that looks nice. I'm gonna make it a tiny bit wider. So I press A to select all the vertices. I'm gonna scale it to the x-axis by 1.3, and I'll snap these. Ooh, they're already on the grid. 
Great. And we're going to now repeat this process to make pillars for all the other sections of the water feature. I'm going to duplicate this and move it around here. I'll rotate it 90 degrees. And let's have a look at let's have a look at this in solid view. You see that's too tall to start with. Again, we're going to wireframe mode. Select just these vertices, grab it in the Z axis, and make sure it sits just underneath there. And now you can see it kind of intersects this other section, which we don't want. So, in top view, I'm going to move it and center it in our frame. I'm going to grab it just over there. And we're going to make it skinnier so that it no longer overlaps. And we'll do that just like that. You can see it's now sitting on the edge of the other container. It's not overlapping. Now I want to look at side view, but from the other angle. And you can do this by pressing Control 3. And you get the opposite side view. Now I can grab this in the Y axis to roughly center it, and that looks about right. Now we're just going to repeat this process for the last two sections. I'm going to duplicate this, place it there, rotate 90 degrees, look at it from side view. Now, if you're not in the wireframe, you might not select all these vertices, and that's why it's so important. So now in the wireframe, we're going to select all of them. Grab it in the Z. And we are going to... We're going to move the whole object to center it. It's hard to tell where the center is, actually. It's about there. Now... Going to make it bigger in this axis and bigger in the x axis. So we'll do this by scaling it up and snapping to grid. And one more time for the very last section. So we'll duplicate this in the y axis. To edit mode, wireframe, select the top, grab it in the Z, and rest it there. Now I want to make this almost the full size of the platform above it, except for the edges. So if I move it, you can see now it lines up with the platform above, but I want it to line up with the inner portion of it, kind of, so it's just smaller. I'm going to grab these. Again, just to the inner edge, and you can see that there. I'm going to grab these. Again, just to the inner edge. And now in solid view, you can see it's just smaller than the section above it, and it has nice symmetrical borders all around. That's great. So let's save our progress. We're almost finished with the modeling. We're just going to add some bevel modifiers to these to make them look more like real objects because nothing in real life is super sharp like these objects are. So we're going to pick one of them, let's say this top one, and we'll zoom into it. We'll go into the modifiers tab and add a bevel modifier. And that effect is too strong. We're going to reduce it to 0.02. That's nice and subtle, maybe 0 0.03 is just a little bit more noticeable. And that's going to work really nicely. Let's collapse this down so it doesn't take up space. And now we're going to select every other object by holding shift and selecting them. Don't forget this and this. And now, after we've selected everything else, we'll select our object with the modifier, and we'll press Control 
L make links modifiers and you can see it's applied the bevel modifier to all of them and that's what we want make sure we save your progress again and let's put the camera in a reasonable place so we can try out some materials and see what our scene is going to look like now we select the camera go to view navigation walk navigation right click on this and assign shortcut and you can press shift F and that's the old shortcut it used to have in Blender. So now we press shift F and you can see we can move the camera around and we can also use WASD to move it in space and we can use Q and E to move it down and up in the scene. So I'm going to move it about here and I can't see the whole scene. I could zoom out and get the whole scene in but I think it looks nicer. I think it has more of an impact if we just zoom out instead. So we're going to change the camera focal length to 35. And again, Shift F to move it just slightly so the whole scene is in frame. I'll move back a touch. And there we have it. Now for the materials in the scene, we're going to use materials by Syncretic 3D. I really highly recommend you check out his channel. Now this guy's a genius and he releases a lot of these for free. So I'll have links to these two materials down below. You're going to get his granite material down here and his concrete material down here. Make sure you like and subscribe while you're there. I really recommend it. You can download this. And I already have these downloaded here. Concrete and granite. I'm going to show you how to pull materials from other blend files without having to open them. We're going to go to File, Append. We're going to select the granite blend. You can see you can go inside it. And this lets you probe really deeply into every feature in that file. We're going to go to Materials, Granite, and we're going to Append, which means we're going to pull that material into our scene. Now, we're going to select these objects and we're going to apply the granite material to them. And I'm going to go into cycles at the same time. So we've applied the granite material to this top object. We could manually go through and apply it to every other object. Or, what's much more easy, is we can enable the material utilities in Blender. We can just search for material in the add-on section. And here, material utilities, enable this. And now, you can simply select these, make sure every granite material is selected, even this one at the back, and now you press Shift Q, Assign Material, Granite. Now we're going to save our progress. Now that we've applied these materials to our objects, we're going to go into Rendered View Mode by pressing Z, and then Rendered. There's two quick things we're going to do. We're going to go into this Output Properties section, Click Render Region, and now it's no longer rendering this bit on the outside, it's only rendering what's within the camera view. And that's going to save us some time. And we can't see this very clearly because it's too dark. So we're going to go to World Properties. I like having this at pure white, so dragging it all the way to the top, and then decreasing the strength to about 0.5. And that's a good level of lighting for most scenes. And you can see this material looks really weird and there's some changes that we have to do in the node editor. So we'll go back to wireframe and we're gonna open up a node editor by going into this corner and dragging down. And here on the top left, we're gonna go to shader editor and press control space. And this makes it a full screen. And now we're gonna change these from UV to object because what's causing the problem is that our objects are not UV unwrapped. But we can still use the object texture coordinates and we'll just plug those in wherever we had the UV texture before. So we'll plug object into there and into there. Object into there and into there. And finally here, we'll plug object there and here, so wherever the UV texture was before. Now we press Control and Space, 
you can see a nice granite material. But there's a small difference between this material and the material I'm going for here, which is that this material is completely smooth, whereas I want a material with a bit of texture and a bit of roughness in it. So, you can see what I mean, it looks completely smooth there, the reflections are completely flat. Again, I'll hover the mouse over the node editor, press control space. We're going to add some texture by adding some displacement. So we'll press shift A, vector displacement. This plugs into the output node there. And we're going to feed this with the color that we're using to give our material color. And this plugs into the height. Now we'll press control space again to preview this material. You can see the render isn't finished, but you can start to see some roughness there. So these reflections have some texture to them. But it looks a bit too strong to me. It looks too bumpy. So I'm going to decrease the scale here from 1 to 0 0.1. We'll preview this. We'll just wait a bit to see what this looks like. It's still a little bit too rough. I'm going to halve it to 0 0.05 and while we wait for this to render make sure you've subscribed to the channel if you haven't if you are subscribed turn on the bell notification so you don't miss the tutorials that I have coming up and this is looking much better so we're going to leave rendered view I'm happy with the granite material on the fountain we're going to move this platform we'll keep it in the scene in case we need it later but we'll just move it out of view I'm going to shift A to add a plane, and this is going to be our ground. I'm going to press S to scale it 16 times, and that works well. And now we're going to apply the concrete slash cement material from Syncretin 3D. Again, great channel, check them out if you haven't already. So download this file, which I have already, and we're going to import it in the same way we did before. Append look for the file called concrete materials and in this blend file he actually forgot to rename the material to concrete this says concrete because I've changed the name but you're looking for a material called material with no numbers afterwards and that'll be the concrete material now we append we go down to the material tab here make sure our plane is selected and apply our concrete material or if you've downloaded it straight from his YouTube video it might be called material only. Now you can see some complicated nodes pop up and if we render it you can see a great cement material on the ground there and that'll do really nicely. The next thing we're going to do is add this image-based lighting, which gives us this lovely background and realistic lighting to our scene. I'll have a link to this website in the description, and you're going to download the Newport Loft HDRI, which I think works really well with this scene, and put it in the same folder as the project you're working with. Let's save our progress before we forget. And now let's apply the image-based lighting. So if we go to the World Properties, and the color, select environment texture, and browse for it here. So within a Newport loft, you can see lots of different images. You might be tempted to use this one because it's 8K, it looks very high resolution. Let's see what that looks like. Now you do get the lighting. We can turn the brightness up. But I find if you use the high resolution models, it massively increases render time because there's too much detail in the scene. And also it's only a JPEG, so you're lacking the high dynamic range that you would with the other file, which I'll show you now. So the file that you should be using to light the scene is this one, .hdr. If we look at the render now, you'll find that because it's a smoother image, it's less noisy, so it renders more quickly, and it has a high dynamic range that makes the lighting look better. But the problem is that it's so blurry, so it doesn't look like you're in a room. But we're gonna use a technique that lets us combine the best of both. Let's leave rendered mode, 
you will full screen the shader editor that will change from object to world. We're actually going to use both textures in different ways. So let's duplicate this. The first one is our HDR, which we're going to use for the lighting. And this one is going to be the high resolution, the 8K image, which we're going to use for a nice looking background, even though it's not going to light our scene. And the way we're going to do this is by adding a mix node, duplicating this, and we're going to mix between these depending on what kind of ray. So Shift A to add input. light path and if it's a camera array we're going to use the 8k image and let's see what this looks like so we're going to rendered view and now to the camera it looks like you're in the high resolution image but when the scene is actually calculating the lighting it's using the lower resolution but the high dynamic range image so you're going to get nice fast renders and the really nice detailed background. And just a recap of the node setup in case you missed it. You can pause here and recreate it. One more camera effect we're going to add is the depth of field. So we will select the camera. Under viewport display, we'll tick limits so we can see where it's rendering. We'll tick depth of field. And you can see this cross is where the camera is focusing. So we're going to move this out until it lands on our scene. And that's going to be the in focus section. Now back to the camera view, rendered view. And we're going to decrease this aperture until we get a nice depth of field that we like for the scene. So we'll have to use unrealistically low f-stop numbers that's because our scene is unrealistically big. We didn't scale this to be the size of a real water feature. Hmm. And at f0.6, you can see the background is starting to blur. And that's going to be a good start for the time being. Make sure you save your progress because we're about to move on to the fluid simulation part of the tutorial. Now, the first thing we need is to add a domain, which is going to contain all of our fluid. And we already know roughly the size because we want the domain to fit within these bounds here. So over the top view, shift add mesh cube. We're going to wireframe mode so we can see this. And we're going to grab it and just place it on the corner there. We'll grab these in the X axis onto this edge there, and this bottom row. We're no longer going to be using the node editor, so we can collapse it by right-clicking, join areas, and click there. And we have more room. We can grab this in the Y-axis until it sits just there. And from side view, we'll select everything with Control a We'll grab it in the Z-axis until it sits on top of our platform, which is just there. Let's select the top, and we'll grab it in the z-axis until it sits just above our first platform. Now the smaller you can get this domain to be, the more efficient your simulation is going to be. So there's no need to make it any bigger than necessary. Now there's a really important step which is going to mess up your simulation if you don't do it. which is to go to Object, Set Origin, Origin to Geometry, which makes sure that the origin is right in the center of the object. Now, if you don't do this now, your simulation will still work, but it'll be in the wrong place. And you can fix this later, actually, if you forget to do it now. After adding the domain, we're also going to add the source of water, which sits at the top of our simulation. We're going to press Shift-A to add a cube. From side view, we're going to grab it in the z-axis so it sits there. Now in edit mode, we're going to scale it in the z by 0 0.2 and we'll grab it so it sits just in our top 
object there. Select fluid, type domain, domain type liquid. Now, if you go into solid view, you'll notice that you can't see through your domain. And we'll fix that by going into the object properties tab, down to viewport display, and display as wire. And now you can see through it. And now we're gonna set the physics settings for the source of the fluid. So select the source of the fluid, Got our physics properties here, fluid. The type is gonna be flow. The flow type is going to be liquid. And the flow behavior, this is super important, is inflow. And we don't just want water to trickle out of it. If you look at the reference, you can see water going up slightly from this source. So we're gonna do the same here. We're gonna give it a bit of velocity upwards as the water is created. So we'll take initial velocity, Z axis, we'll try 0.5, and we might have to tweak with this later. Now we're ready to set the collision types for the other objects. And these are all going to be collision objects, where the water is going to bounce off them. So we select the first one, fluid, type, effector, an effector type collision. We're gonna go through and set this for all of them. Now we select the domain, and we're ready to simulate the fluid. So we're gonna start off with the default setting, 64 resolution. We're gonna turn down the time scale because I find it runs too fast by default. I find the other settings work really well. I've seen some other YouTubers increase this minimum time step, but I imagine that would slow down in your simulation. You want the minimum time step to be really low so that when it's not having to work very hard, when the collisions are all very simple, it doesn't have to do as many calculations. Now, if you scroll down, you'll see these cache settings, and by default, it's only gonna render 50 frames. This simulation looks really nice over a long period, so let's increase it to at least 250. So we'll leave this at one, and we're gonna bake the data. And the really nice thing about this new fluid simulation solver and blender is we can press escape to pause the simulation so we can see what it's doing at the moment. But it hasn't ruined it for us, we can resume. Whereas in the old solver, you'd have to start the whole thing again. So I'm just looking at the Z velocity. And it looks too high, actually. The fluid looks like it's splashing up and I don't want it to hit the top of our domain. Let's select this fluid source and under initial velocity, I'll reduce this to 0.2. Now select the domain again, free the bake, and bake the data. Now if you scroll down here, there's gonna be a cache and a cache type, and there are settings there that let you visualize your simulation as you go along. The reason I'm not doing that is because I've found those to be super buggy. So if I don't use those, Okay, I have to pause my simulation sometimes to see what it's doing, but at least it's gonna run much more smoothly and it's not gonna break as often. So this looks like a nice simulation. Now the first time I ran this, I had this weird problem of expanding water. So you can see the water trickling down there. There's a nice small stream of water, but then it looks bigger the second time. And you can see there's more fluid on this platform than there was on this platform there. And then the last platform is even fuller and it's overflowing. And this was a really weird issue. But if you get that, it's very simple to fix. You have to free your bake. And then here, under the liquid setting, decrease the particle radius. And I found anywhere between 0.8 to 0.9 works well for this scene but you might have to play around and find something that works with your specific geometry. So I'm gonna set mine to 0.8. I know that it's gonna work well with this project, so I'm gonna increase the divisions. If I had more time, I would do 200 or 256, but I find with the new solver, a small number of divisions goes really far. So 128 is all I needed in this scene, and I'm really happy with how this looks. So I'm gonna set it to 128. I'm gonna press bake, and we're gonna wait for it to bake. 
Now this is a very long process. Depending on your computer, it's gonna take at least hours, maybe longer. So while you wait, make sure you've liked this video if you haven't already, subscribe if you wanna see more like it, and make sure the bell notification is ticked. And why not leave a comment down below what tutorial would you like to see next? Now, as soon as the liquid bake is finished, we're ready to mesh it. And this is a really powerful feature of the new fluid solver in Blender. We're gonna collapse these down just to save some space. We're gonna expand the mesh settings and tick mesh. Now, these default settings are really great. The only one that we have to change is use speed vector. We're gonna tick that, and that will allow us to add a motion blur to our video later on. And we're gonna click bake mesh. And I find this step is usually quicker than the fluid simulation itself, but there's still time for you to hit the like button if you haven't already. The mesh is now finished, and we're gonna set up the particles. Now actually, I didn't find particles made this scene look any better. Maybe because the camera is quite far away, and you have to be closer to the fluid to really appreciate the effect they have. I'm gonna show you exactly how to set them up so you can use them in your scenes, even if we're not gonna use them here. We'll tick all of them, spray, foam, and bubbles, and we're going to bake particles. I find if you increase this up-res factor that you get too many particles, so I keep that the same. All the other settings I'm really happy with too. And once that's finished, we're going to create the geometry for the particles. So we'll press Shift A, add an icosphere, and here, we're gonna reduce these subdivisions because there might be millions of these, so you want the geometry to be as simple as possible. We'll drag this off camera. We'll duplicate it because we want bubbles to look different from foam. And we're gonna open up our shader editor again to create these materials. We're gonna make a new material for the first one. We're gonna call this foam. We're going to full screen. And let's delete the principal BSDF. Let's press Shift A to add a shader, a glass shader. Shift A shader. Diffuse shader. And we're going to combine these with a add shader, which we'll plug into the end. So I'll plug both of these into there change this to have the same properties as water and the diffuse shader will turn down slightly now we'll leave full screen with control and click we'll select this we want this material to be a variation of the foam one so we select foam we click here to duplicate it and we call it bubble now we're going to connect this up here and we can delete the others we just need this glass shader and because these bubbles are air their index of refraction is going to be 1 and we're going to rename these icospheres to avoid confusion so we're going to call this bubble icosphere we're going to call this foam icosphere we're going to scale them down to 0 0.1 is that right? so the foam icosphere has foam and the bubble like this has bubble. Great. Ooh. Now we're going to select our fluid object again. We're going to go into particle settings. And you can see it's created all of these particle settings for the different types of particles. Now we're going to select them one by one and assign them to the correct material. Spray. We're going to render as object. We'll select the Foam Microsphere. We're going to use the same material for foam and spray. We're going to select foam, render as object foam. Render as object. The object is going to be foam Microsphere and bubbles. We'll set as the bubble Microsphere. And now, depending on your scene, you would render with this, and it might add some texture and some extra detail to your scene. I didn't find it made a difference, but it increased the render time a lot. So, 
I'm going to remove all of these from the seam because all I care about is the mesh. Now the last thing we're going to do before talking about rendering settings and compositing is add a moving camera into the scene that's going to track exactly where the fluid is and show you the most exciting part of the scene. To give us more space we're going to close this shading area and we're going to add a new camera to the scene. So shift A camera. Now the camera is selected so we can press Control and 0 and this new camera is now the default camera and we can press shift F and use the same walking navigation that we did before. So we can press S to move backwards through the scene and you know, WASD to move forward, backwards, left and right, just like in a video game. And we have Q to go down and E to go up. We're gonna start it off over here. Now what we're going to do to get a smooth movement going all around is we're going to turn on automatic keyframes for the camera. We're going to play the animation and as the fluid flows through the scene, we're going to move the camera around to focus on the section that we want. Now when it gets to the end, I don't want it to go back to the beginning because then you might overwrite some of the earlier keyframes. So we'll extend our scene slightly to 350 frames, let's say. Now the order that we do this is important. We're gonna press space, then shift F, and we're gonna move the camera to space. You can see I'm controlling the camera. I'm gonna scroll down. I made an error there, which I'm gonna go back and fix. But first, I have to clear the keyframes. Clear keyframes. Now the error was, if I press shift F, and I press S, you can see it moves too quickly. And a really cool feature in Blender is you can scroll down on your mouse and that slows down these movements. You've got to scroll up to speed them up. But I want nice, slow, steady movements. So I'm going to... I scroll down there until I have this nice, slow speed of movement. Now we're going to do the same thing again. So space and then shift F. You can see we have a nice, slow camera movement. I'm going to move the camera around. Right at the end, we're going to pan out to give us a nice view of the whole scene. And we're done. So I'm going to stop the animation before it loops around. And I'll turn off key in. And now we can watch this animation. So if we press space, it's going to play. And you can see the same movement, but it's quite jerky. And we're going to fix that. I accidentally turned on this at some point so I'll turn this back off because all we have to see is the fluid domain and I'll make it solid as well because it's no longer covering our scene I want to see the actual fluid so we'll open up a new window there and this time we're going to make it the graph editor graph editor we're going to select the camera and you can see these are the keyframes for the camera movement. You can press control and middle mouse to zoom out and get a better idea of them. And you can see they're quite jerky. So there are two things we're going to do to fix that. The first one is go to key and sample keyframes and that makes sure there's no gaps inside. And then we're going to look for smooth keys so for me that's Alt and O, on Windows it'll be something else. But we're going to press this and you can see every time you press it, these curves are getting smoother. Now I've pressed it 42 times, you can see the graph is much smoother. And now if we play it, the movement is much smoother than it was before. And it's starting to look really good. Now the issue with that kind of movement 
is that if we wanted to add depth of field like we had before, it would be really tricky to focus for each section of the animation. So instead of focusing manually by changing this distance, we're going to focus on an empty object and we're going to move that throughout the scene to make sure that it's always focusing on the right part. I'll press Shift A to add a empty plane axis. I'll make sure we can see this. So that's over there. We're finished with this window so we can close it. I'm going to move this to where the initial focus is going to be, which is this fluid coming up. I'm going to camera view. I'm going to add a location keyframe for this empty. I'm going to move forward in the timeline to this point, and now I'm going to move the focus to where we want it to be. We want it to be just here, right in the middle. And again, I'm going to insert a location keyframe, move forward until we want the focus somewhere else. As the camera drops down here, we want the focus to be on the second kind of waterfall section. So we're going to grab this in the Z axis until it's lying on that plane and we'll grab it locking the z-axis and you can see where the axis disappears into the fluid that means it's really close to it so i'll move it there add a location keyframe we'll move again add a location keyframe Add a location keyframe on here as we're panning out. Let's just add one here. Location keyframe. And then as we pan out from the scene, I want the focus to be here. That's a nice central part of the animation, which I want to draw the viewer's attention to. So I move this back over here, insert the location keyframe, and you can see that there. Now, we'll select the camera again, and under camera settings, ooh, that's the wrong camera. Select camera.001, and make sure it's this new camera that you're looking at. Tick depth of field and select focus object. You can either type here empty or you can click this eyedropper and click on the empty object. Now if we lower this depth of the field really low just to confirm that it's working and go into rendered mode you can see that this part of the animation is in focus the background is out of focus and so is the foreground and the focus really is where you want it to. I remember we don't have a water material, so we'll add that really quickly. New material on the water, call it water. This is going to be a glass VSDF, roughness of zero, index of refraction of 1.33. Now once that's had a bit more time to render, you can see the middle section is nice and in focus. The background is just slightly blurred. In the foreground, which you can just about see there, is also blurred, so the focus is exactly where we want. Use nodes, and there are two tricks that we're going to add. The first one is motion blur, which I like to use in cycles, but that doesn't seem to be supported yet with this new fluid simulation solver. And the second one, because this scene is so complex, is going to take ages to render. We're going to add the new Intel AI denoising feature to massively cut down on the render times. Let's leave rendered view and move to the compositor and we're nearly finished. We'll open up this new window again. We'll change this to compositor. So we have all the necessary information to apply those features. Let's go into the render layers tab. We're going to enable vector. 
and we're going to add two nodes. The first one is under filter, vector blur, and the next one is also under filter, denoise. Now we're going to plug these in in a very particular way. We're going to plug in the noisy image into the denoise, and we're going to plug the denoising normal and the denoisy albedo into the albedo. Now into this vector blur, we're going to plug depth into the Z, image into the image, that's correct, and vector is going to go into the speed. Now what we've done there is firstly denoise the image using this really nice denoiser, and then we're applying this blur to it, it's going to fake a motion blur. Now let's see what this looks like. Let's pick a nice frame. You might have noticed this is a low quality fluid. This is 64 resolution, not 128. That's just to help make this tutorial. But the video you saw in the beginning was 128. So we're gonna pick, this is a nice frame. Let's render it and see what that looks like. So by default, you use 128 samples. I have no time for that. Let's, let's do a ridiculously small number of samples, eight. Realistically, you'll have to increase this, but I just want to show how powerful this denoiser is and that you can get a pretty reasonable image even with a really low sample count. So you can see it's already finishing these first squares in the middle. And while we're just waiting for this to render, Think about a small tip that you picked up from this tutorial that others might find useful and leave a comment with it down below to help others out that are just discovering this video. So when it finishes rendering, you'll get something that looks like this. You can see very noisy, but then as soon as the denoising is applied, it looks like this and that is so much better. Now the motion blur with the default settings, I had one here. I know it's too blurred, so I've reduced it to 0 0.5 and this is what it looks like with the motion blur and the denoising. So the motion blur effect I think is quite subtle, but it's better than it being too strong and this is what you can expect to see. Let's save your progress so you don't lose your hard work and your scene is ready to go. All you have to do is render and render animation and I will render this with this moving camera and the far camera which stays in the same place and that's just to give me some variety and you can switch between them by selecting this one and pressing control and zero and now that makes this the default camera so now when I render it'll be from this camera thanks so much for watching I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial if you followed along and made this yourself leave your results down in the comments and it's going to be a lot of fun looking at those and seeing what you've made from this tutorial again make sure you've hit the like button if you haven't already it really helps the channel out and subscribe to see more videos like this. See you next time.